Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today, I will be reviewing Boosh, Empire of Exiles by Aaron M. Evans, which is alliteration or assonance, depending on which definition you're using of either one of those. And the reason I don't have the book in my hand is because this was an arc. And you're like, Alan, why are you reading arcs when you have all this other stuff to read? I don't know except for the fact that I read the premise of this one about archivists, and the main characters were freaking archivists, a.k.a., you know, nerds or scholars or people who, you know, delve through ancient texts. And if you've been watching my channel any, any length of time, you know that I really like academic characters. Uh, and so it just sounded super interesting. And so I, on a lark, decided to, uh, to read it. So thank you so much uh, to the author, to Orbit Books, for um, allowing me a, an early copy of this. Um, and yeah, so without wasting any more time. Let's get down to business. So Evans is most well known for her uh, Brimstone Angels novels within the Forgotten Realms universe, and man, like, I would have consumed those. If this was back when I, I, I read nothing but Forgotten Realms books, I absolutely would have already consumed these. Uh, so that's awesome. So this is her first uh, novel outside of the, uh, of the, the Dungeons and Dragons universes, I believe. And it is a good one, guys. This is, this is a fun book. Uh, so Empire of Exiles, uh, is this, it has this kind of Byzantine Persian feel to it, at least via the, a lot of the naming uh, conventions, at least that's what I got from it. And the story kind of place, takes place in this single kingdom uh, that basically everyone lives in because many years ago there was a war with the changelings and, you know, they, they, the changelings chased everybody into this kingdom and then the changelings were sealed out by this enormous wall made of salt that these, these sorcerers uh, sacrifice themselves to, to like construct. And that, like, like the lore in the history of this world, guys, is, is one of my favorite parts of it. So the changelings are, are sealed outside this kingdom, and that's why it's called the Empire of Exiles, because everyone lives in this empire. They're all exiles from their homeland because the changelings chased them all inside, and now there's the salt wall that keeps them all out. And so because of this, this main area is, it's a melting pot of all the different, uh, races in the world. And, at first I thought it was like, I thought it was just humans. And then I was kind of shocked when it, when it said, you know, with no fanfare that the lower part of someone's body was tentacles. And I'm like, oh, so there's an octopus person. Okay, <laughs> like that's fine. But I did not expect that. And then, uh, so there are people, there are, there is a race that where the, the, their, what am I doing? <laughs> where their, their bottom half are tentacles. And there's another race that they have these curved horns and from it they hang these kind of like religious charms that are always kind of like like tinkling like a like a wind chime thing and these guys reminded me of uh tieflings from uh from the Dungeons and dragons universes and i i don't know if that's because uh, a tiefling was the main character in uh, evans's other novels and she likes tieflings i don't know if they're tiefling inspired but you know they could be uh and so there's that race and various types of other uh, humanoids, and you know no one really has, and and they're all forced, they're all forced to live together, and have been for a while because of uh, the aforementioned changeling. Now another thing that is behind this story is 30 years ago there was a conspiracy by one of the nobles to overthrow the emperor uh, after what was called the, the fratricide, which is freaking cool and it's not actually in the book and I wish, like, you're, li you're looking through the Dramatis Personae and you're like, oh, killed by the fratricide, boom, killed by the fratricide, boom, killed by the fratricide, boom, killed by... And I'm like, dang, I, I hope, I hope Evans writes like a novella or like a story or something about the fratricide because I really wanted to see it. Anyway, the second son of the Imperial line decided that he wanted to be Emperor, I suppose, and, you know, murdered his oldest brother and, like, his kids and I think a bunch of other... Anyway, he didn't quite get to his younger brother, so when he died, the younger brother, you know, acceded the throne. And this nobleman tries to overthrow him and there were a bunch of people involved in it and then uh, he had a turncoat from within. A turncoat from the Emperor was working with with uh, this nobleman named Rodolfo and then she turncoated and you know the rebellion the rebellion was quashed and he was put to death and the way Rodolfo lent legitimacy to his uh, his coup essentially was that he said he had uh, a long a, a princess that had been that had been killed during the fratricide uh, but had secretly survived and that he had her and that was what he was he was using to accede to the throne it's kind of like a it's like an, an Anastasia-esque 
type thing. I know Evan said it's based on, it's based on a, a different kind of historical thing. Uh, but it, it is, it's as if he found, he found a daughter they thought was dead, and that's what he's using to claim legitimacy to the throne. So he's going to put her on the throne, but, you know, really, he's going to rule with a puppet thing. So that is also in the backdrop as well as the whole, you know, salt wall type thing. And what I really like, even from the get-go, is every part, uh, you know, of the, of the book is, begins with a flashback to right before Rodolfo was executed. And it has kind of a different voice because you're inside the head of um, Rodolfo's brother, uh, his younger brother, uh, and Rodolfo back and forth. So it, it covers just that uh, short time where he was locked up or under guard before they executed him. And the back and forth between these, these two brothers is really, really good. Like, some of my favorite parts were those beginning uh, sections, those sections that began, that began each part. Because Rodolfo's freaking awesome. Like, man, like... I wish he hadn't gotten hanged, but, you know, it is what it is. So, our main character is Quill. That's not his name. It's like, name's like Sesquilio, but they call him Quill, which is, you know, fun. Uh, especially considering he's like, a, he's like a bureaucrat or something. He's a member of this kind of quasi-religious sect thing that's like, it's like part bureaucrat, part magistrate. It never actually comes out in info dumps what exactly the sect is, which is fine. I'm just, I'm telling you what, what I gathered from it. And everything kicks off because Quill witnesses a grisly, like, multiple murder. And this, you know, flips him out. And so the entire story is, one, a story of conspiracy and kind of what went on with the conspiracy 30 years ago, but as well as a murder mystery unfolding within this city and Quill's determination to get to the bottom of it and find out who killed these people. And joining him uh, are, are three other main characters, uh, two of which are archivists. One is a specialist and one is a generalist, which I'll get to in a second, and then a, a detective character, which I was excited about because, as you guys know, I love the detective characters. Uh, Sam Vimes is my favorite fantasy character of all time, and he's, you know, Commander of the Watch. And so here's where the archivists come in. Quill is, has been assigned by his sect to kind of uh, facilitate the, the extraction of these artifacts to the family of, uh, of Rodolfo, the, the, the guy who tried to commit the coup. And we have the, the chief generalist who's kind of like the overseer, and her name is Amadea or Amadia. I don't know which one, but I'm going to say Amadea because it reminds me of, Rock me, Amadeus! Rock me, Amadeus! It just reminds me of Amadeus every time I read it. So I'm going to say Amadea. Rock me, Amadeus! And so she lacks any real powers, but she oversees and makes sure that the specialists are taken care of. And the specialists, this is where the awesome kind of magic system that Evans has developed really comes into play. So each, there's a specialist for each kind of like type of material. So salt, uh, sand, um, bone, wood, bronze, ink, and there might be some others, but they have the ability to, the specialists have the ability to uh, kind of divine the provenance of these particular materials, which is why they work in the archives, because they can tell where they're from, they can identify, you know, the dynasty, and, and, and if it's real, if it's fake, they can identify all of this by kind of making their minds in tune with the material. So this, uh, this one specialist whose specialization is ink, uh, she can tell what, uh, what the ink was made of, what the ink was written in, how long it was written, like where this kind of ink comes from, all because of her specialization which is just really freaking cool. But we also find out that each one of these elements has times where they come into alignment, where their element is stronger, but while the, while the element is, is in alignment, they run the risk of spiraling. And when they spiral, they lose control, and the element kind of takes possession of them. And if they are not stopped, and this is really kind of the, the job of the generalist to oversee them and kind of talk them down off the ledge, because for the bronze specialists, like they'll start, like bronze will just start oozing out, like the bronze will become part of them to where if it's not stopped, they will eventually become nothing but composites of that material. So the bronze specialists will become bronze statues and they're dead. Like that's it. And this is, this is, 
uh, what happened, but on a much larger scale with the sorcerers who built the salt wall, is they all, like, channeled their salt power with such force that they all became salt, and that's kind of, it's just kind of creepy. The, the salt wall is kind of made up of these dead sorcerers. And one of the really cool things, uh, and, and that is a testament to Evans's writing, is that when, when the specialists are spiraling, they think in terms of their element. So they'll start talking in terms of, like, in terms of bronze or in terms of ink or bone or sand. And that's hard to describe, except that it's really cool. Like, the, the, the thoughts of the, of the characters change completely, and everything is in relation to the ink or the bone or the bronze or the sand. And it's just really, really cool. Now, the specialists, obviously, their ability is used for, for uh, really kind of research purposes, but then they're are very few left in the world, these sorcerers, who can m manipulate these properties. They can kind of control those, these elements more than just, you know, getting in tune with them. And they are much, much more powerful, but as, as such, much, much more dangerous. And Evans has described elsewhere that she really wanted uh, a magic system that mirrored uh, kind of an anxiety attack or a panic attack, and that's really what it feels like when when uh, when when Amadea is trying to talk the spiraling archivist. It does sound like you know someone exercising the same techniques to uh, help someone when they're having an anxiety attack or or a panic attack. So that is that's that's really really interesting that you can see that influence there in in this magic system. So, these four main characters, I liked all of them. I really liked the bad guys. Like, I don't know why. The bad guys were, were they were just freaking cool. Like, I loved the villains in this, um, as the villains, you know, are revealed, and, you know, is this the real villain, or, oh no, is it this, this the one? There are many plots, uh, twists, and turns, and it doesn't always go uh, the way that you expect it to. I will say that Quill is the most annoying main character that I didn't hate. I love Quill, and yet Quill is an absolute pest. He is annoying and shrill, but no one can say he is not single-minded. What I think I love about Quill is I love his gumption, because he is so persistent and so focused on solving this murder, that even when everyone else is trying to deal with stuff that, like, has larger stakes than the murder of, of this person that Quill knew, they'll be talking about, like, you know, history and imp implications and things like that, and Quill's like, yeah, okay, but, uh, what about this murder mystery? What about the murder mystery? Like, what about, what about finding out who killed this guy? Um, I came here because I was trying to find out who killed this guy. Uh, what if we focused on that? And then when they ignore him, he, like, storms off, and then, you know, something bad happens, and he runs back, he's like, guys, I need help. Help me solve this mystery. So I love it. I love how I love how how dogged uh, Quill is, almost even more than the detective. So he is that kind of character that that you could find annoying, but there's something, there's just something about Quill that makes you be like, you know what? I got you. I got your back, buddy. He just he skirts that and avoids being an insufferable twerp. Amadea the Generalist is great. I love her. I love her backstory. I love her compassion for the specialists under her care. Uh, Yinny the Ink Specialist. Uh, I love the the kind of wrestling with, with the things that are happening and the choices that she has to make in this. And I love the detective. I will say that the detective is the least fleshed out of the characters, and that made me sad because I wanted more of him, but he is in it less than the other three, kind of like by a long shot. So most of this is a slow build as piece by piece of of the, the mystery is uncovered and, you know, they discover things in the archive about historical records and things like that. And it is just, it is a slow build, but it never, it's never boring because these characters and this world and this lore is just fascinating. It is so interesting. Like, I wanted, like, I wish there was a source book of, like, the lore and all of these various gods and things that I could, you know, that I could read and learn more about it. And then it hits kind of a breakneck conclusion at about, well, I, I can't say because then you'd be expecting it. But at one point, it hits, like, a breakneck conclusion, and I just had to finish reading it. I had to. And things whirlwind. It is as if you have been hit by the wildebeest stampede from the Lion King, and you are just carried, you know, away and you're you're stomped by the by the plot just like Mufasa <laughs> from the Lion King. So, if that's too soon, I apologize. It is a whirlwind to the end, almost where at some time some parts and I felt this way about uh, uh Chiago Abdallah's a touch of light in places. 
it almost felt a little too fast for me, kind of the resolution uh, and the, 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 the climax of, of the book, to where it was a little jarring, as if I felt like some stuff had been taken out, and I don't know if that's true, but it, it just felt like uh, a little fast for me in parts, but... I mean, it was it was awesome. It was a it was a fantastic conclusion, uh, a great mystery with a great like a great conclusion. It wasn't dumb or anything. You know, sometimes mysteries you get to the mystery and it was just dumb, and you're like, oh well, I couldn't have figured that out because that's stupid. So it wasn't like that at all. The few things that I that that I I took issue with or that you might take issue with. I did not have a map, and this is because I had the E arc. I did not have a physical copy. Uh, a map. I have seen the map, which is flipping awesome uh, that's in the actual book, but I didn't have a map. And oh goodness, did I need a map. I needed a map so bad, y'all. All I wanted, all I wanted in life was a map so I could see where these places were and the names of this stuff. There are a lot of names that are not super uh, familiar, so it's, it's hard to keep track of like, wait, did I hear that name before? A lot of names and a lot of buzzwords where if you've played JRPGs, guys, you're going to be fine in the buzzwords. It's just a lot of front-loaded stuff. I've explained to you a lot of, a, a lot of them, so you, you might be okay. Uh, but there is a lot. If you, you know, feel like you're drowning when that happens, just be warned. There is a lot of that at the beginning. But eventually, as long as you refer to the, the Dramatis Personae, or if you prefer to figure stuff out by yourself, uh, it's not really a problem you know, about a quarter way through the book, you just acclimate, you know, like you do with, with anything that has uh, a lot of unfamiliar vocabulary uh, there at the front. Uh, there are a couple romances which, if you don't really like romance, is good for you because they're not really a big part of the story at all. In fact, one of them I didn't even realize was supposed to be a romance till, like, toward the end. I'm like, oh, oh, I guess they were supposed to be a romance. I didn't really see it. And then the other one is, eh, y'all know, romance isn't my thing, but... It's fine. It's there if you want it. If it's not, if not, if you don't like it, super easy to ignore. But other than that, this is a fascinating world with fascinating lore, an awesome magic system, a fantastic conclusion. I am so excited about the bloody sequel for this because it's a murder mystery, right? And I was like, where is this going to end? Like, what is the... Like, okay, we're going to solve the murder. That's fine. What's next? And now I know. And I'm so excited to see what's next. But even after it's over, I'm like, that is a lot that is resolved. I'm eager to see what's next. So, guys, on the Kingpin approval system, I give this book an excellent plus. And out of five stars, I give it five stars. Because, guys, this was, this was fantastic. I cannot wait for the sequel. Um, Empire of Exiles is out November 8th. You should absolutely go pre-order this one if you have listened to my recommendations about pre-orders before and you have been pleased. Do this again, because I promise, if any of that sounded interesting to you, this is the book for you. So go pre-order this beastie, because it's a good one. Guys, that is it for me for today. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys. Bye.